Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this OncLive Peer Exchange. This program will feature expert insight related to reshaping the oncology care delivery and payment models under healthcare reform. My name is Dr. Andrew Bacora. I am Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer of the John Thurow Cancer Center and President of Regional Cancer Care Associates in Hackensack, New Jersey. Participating today in this discussion are Dr. Michael Colage, National Medical Director for Oncology Strategy at Aetna in Hartford, Connecticut, and Dr. Jeffrey Ward, past president of the Washington State Medical Oncology Society, past chair of the ASCO Clinical Practice Committee, chair of the ASCO Payment Reform Workgroup, and practicing oncologist at the Swedish Cancer Institute in Edmonds, Washington. Thank you for participating in this discussion, and let's begin. The United States spends more than $125 billion annually on cancer care. By 2022, there will be 18 million people with cancer, and by 2030, the cancer incidence is expected to rise by 2.3 million new cases per year. The high cost of cancer drugs and the buy and bill model of paying for them under Medicare have received significant attention. But other factors such as highly variable practice patterns and lack of meaningful engagement of patients in care decisions have also been called into question. So let's start today by briefly discussing the cost of cancer care, and we'll start with Mike. Thanks, Andrew. So it's fair to say that for both Medicare and commercial insurance companies, cancer's on the radar screen. And I think for many, many years, um, even discussing the cost of cancer care was almost perceived as radioactive, but that's clearly changed. And the reason it's changed um, is several fold. First, um, cancer spend makes up about 11% of the commercial payers um, uh, annual spend. So it's on, the, it's on the radar screen. Second of all, um, it, AHRQ every year does this study where they assign um, healthcare costs by disease category. And what they show is that clearly in the U.S. we spend more on cardiac care than anything else. But if you look at the cost per affected U.S. citizen, cancer's right up there. It used to be number one, now it's just number two by a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Um, and the third thing is trend. And uh, if we look back five, seven years ago, the trend was totally out of control. Uh, it seems to have mitigated a, la a, a little bit in the last couple of years, and I think that's uh, related actually to the mitigation of all healthcare spending trend, which we've seen the last couple of years. But there's a lot of early indicators that it's going to take off. The, the complexity of cancer care and the cost of cancer care, though, is partially related to the fact that it's very heterogeneous, right? So as medical oncologists, we are like the blind men with the elephant, right? We got one little piece that we're focused on. But when you're the payer, you're thinking about um, the various trajectories a cancer patient's care might take. So you've got a patient who gets surgery and surgery alone, either complex surgery or not so complex surgery. And we've got the chemotherapy patient, we've got the patient who gets multiple modalities, and then we of course have end of life costs. So I, I think uh, each of those individual categories of patients require a different approach. And, and I think that's a challenge going forward. So I have a question for, for both of my colleagues, maybe starting with you, Mike. As you look at the rapid changes in cancer care, going towards personalized medicine, the use of genomics and genomic-like studies, and now the new and expensive medications such as checkpoint inhibitors, how does that factor into your thinking? So again, now we're restricting uh, care really to patients who have either a high risk of systemic disease or have systemic disease. And they are clearly the, the single most expensive uh, group of patients. Uh, I, you know, having been a, a doctor for a long time and an oncologist for a long time and now on the payer side, I would say that, that the general thinking is that what we would like to make sure happens is the right patient gets the right treatment at the right time, really. It, and, and to the extent possible, eliminate barriers to making sure that happens. What I think is not necessarily um, a, a, a path forward is uh, unbridled enthusiasm, and if it works in this, it must work in that. And, and I think that sort of, um, somebody said, uh, I've heard it more than once, I'm an oncologic chef. Um, th that's, those days are over. You better be a good oncologic short order cook 
because we depend on you to make that hamburger right. But an oncologic chef where you decide you're going to try a little bit of ingredient A, ingredient B is probably an unsustainable approach going forward. Okay. Jeff? Sure. I think that when we talk about cost of cancer care, we're increasingly uh, thinking about it as buckets. So uh, as medical oncologists, we used to only be concerned about what we actually do. Uh, n now we're saying, okay, and how do we contribute to different parts of this equation? So there's a uh, uh, hospital costs are probably the single biggest uh, cost of uh, cancer care. Uh, there is then the drugs themselves uh, and radiation oncology. Uh, there's imaging and diagnostics. Each of those are costs and we can say how can we impact those uh, in a way that will improve the health of the patient as well as, as lower those costs. I think, but within those buckets you also have to look at trajectory. So though uh, hospital costs are the biggest bucket, they're not the one that's growing the fastest. The one that's growing the fastest is the drug piece. If you look at all those buckets and you say which is the lowest cost, you're talking about E&M services to physicians and infusion services in, in, their, in their clinics. And uh, um, that's a, a very small piece of the pie, but we may be able to impact those big ticket items. I, I recently saw some excellent uh, data from uh, our competitor, Optum. And uh, the, the data looked at the impact of the introduction of imatinib uh, to the management of patients with CML. So as oncologists, all of us actually took care of CML before imatinib, and it was terrible. Mm -hmm. And then imatinib, of course, changed everything, right? So what Optum did was they, they looked at, first of all, they looked at life expectancy of patients treated. And as we all know, imatinib changed that dramatically for the better. Then what they looked at was the cost structure of those patients who were treated with imatinib. And what they saw over a period of a decade was that the total cost of care went down, but the cost attributable to the targeted therapy went up. So it's okay if you spend more on the drug if you get a better outcome, right? And especially if it comes at a lower total cost of care because those patients weren't going to the hospital anymore, right? right? So that, that, that is the kind of the poster child of what we want to accomplish. I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, I think we all agree that as the population ages, and as fewer people die of cardiovascular disease and infectious diseases and other related uh, illnesses, that cancer will become more and more prominent. What about this?